Welcome to the Andy Dare Show. This is episode 51. This week I'm joined by Chris Kirkwood of the Meat Puppets. We talk about their ups, their downs, their triumphs, their tragedies, and the light at the end of the tunnel. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Andy Dare Show. Thank you so much for checking out the Andy Dare Show. Yes, this is my episode 51, and I'm joined by the bassist of one of my favorite bands of all time, one of the greatest American bands of all time, the Meat Puppets. His name is Chris Kirkwood. He's been through hell and back. An amazing story, and it's all told in their new book, um, Too High to Die, Meet the Meat Puppets by Greg Prado. That book is out now, but... I got a great interview with them. I think we go about an hour touching from everything from them riding dirt bikes, you know, in the desert. They're from the Southwest. Um, They were dirt bike riders as kids. Then they, uh, you know, got turned on to music in high school. Never looked back. Been through a bunch of ups and downs. More than most bands could say, and uh, but I'm glad to say that Chris is back and better than ever. Saw them at the Double Door last November, and they blew my mind. Incredible band. I mean, the guys are in their 50s, and they're just hitting their prime now. You know, 32 years into an amazing career. Check them out, the Meat Puppets. But before I get into any of that, I want to get the sponsors out of the way. Um, if you're listening to this, it is going to be Father's Day tomorrow, so it's too late to order the Grant Mangrake, but I'm so thankful for all the people that did put in orders for the Mangrake. They clicked through on my website, theandydareshow.com, and now we're able to keep the lights on a little bit longer here. It means a lot to me. It's a great piece, huge chunk of Detroit steel that sits on your existing grate. And it instantly allows you to achieve steakhouse, burgers, fish, chicken. You get those dark grill marks that you really can't get on those chintzy little grates that sit on your grate on your grill when you get the grill, you know. These are just an awesome thing. It's the man grate. Do click through the Andy Dare show. It means a lot to me for you supporting the show. This is our fifty first episode. We wouldn't be here without the man grate. And bye. Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue. Are you having a backyard party this summer? If you're living in America, most likely you are. If you're living in Chicagoland, most likely you should call Uncle Bub's barbecue and have them cater your party. They have smokers, grills, they have barbecue experts, they have girls that will set up the buffet, they will clean your plate from you, they will do anything you want, they'll even give you a back rub. It is Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue. Not only are they a family-owned and operated restaurant outside of Chicagoland, they are also a full-service, full-stop catering uh, company. And uh, they do everything from pig roast to luau's to company picnics to corporate lunches. They'll bring a buffet, set it up right in your office. They do everything you ask. It's Uncle Bub's. Check them out on the web. They've got menus there, unclebubs.com. And if you have any questions, they have a helpful staff that are here to answer any questions you have. Um, Give them a call. It's 630-493-9000. And if you're in, uh, you know, the Chicago suburbs, the western suburbs, do check them out. It's 132 South Cass, Westmont, Illinois. And by Secondhand Mall. Yes, if you're any fan of the show, you know my record store of 28 years. Remember when records shut its doors last year? And uh, while it was a sad time, it was also a rebirth because Secondhand Mall bought out the remaining inventory. And so now it's cool. It's a record store. It's got a huge vinyl selection. It also has power tools. It also has musical instruments. It also has computer games, video games, electronics, computer accessories, all sorts of good stuff. Huge 45 selection. If you're into vinyl, come check it out. I know a lot of these kids are starting to get turned on to vinyl after the CDs are going the way of the dodo. Why not you turn that pile of CDs in your closet into some extra spending money this summer? If you're in the western suburbs of Chicago, there's no better place than Secondhand Mall. They're located at 309 West Dogden Avenue in Westmont. Um, You can give them a call if you have any questions. They buy, sell, trade. That's 630-810-9980. And it's just a good time to go. It's a good atmosphere. Nice guys. It's like back back in the day, you'd like to go to a store, you know, crack open a can of Coke and talk to the guys. And, you know, 
per- peruse the selection if you know what I'm talking about. That's what's good and fun to do here. That's Secondhand Mall. Check them out on the web. It's secondhandmall.com, 2ndhandmall.com. All right, that's it for the sponsors. want to thank the sponsors for helping me out these last 50 episodes. Um, what's new in the world of Andy right now? Pretty much been doing a music segment, a music minute on the Kevin Matthews Show. He's, uh, you know, a broadcasting hero of mine, but he's also just a nice guy. I want to congratulate him for becoming a grandfather last week. I'm glad everything went well with that. And uh, check him out. He's on the Dahl Network. That's D-A-H-L dot com. He does a two shows a week, and usually you can find me on one of those shows a week doing my Talking Tunes with Andy segment. This last week I talked about all the famous base, all, well, just all the professional baseball players that have tried their hand in music, and uh, it's a pretty funny list. It's obviously not too extraordinary, but I thought it was a funny thing, you know, now that the Sox are doing well, baseball season's pretty much picking up at a good pace. So check it out. That's at doll.com. It is a pay site. It's 10 bucks a month or 100 bucks for the year. You get two months free that way. But do sign up, subscribe. You get the Steve Dahl Show, the James Van Osdell Show. He's a great guy. He was on the show about a month ago. The Kevin Matthews Show and now the Dino Stamatopoulos Show. I'm sorry, I can never say the guy's last name. It's just the Dino Show, a.k.a. Starburns from Community. He's funny. It's a great show as well. So why not just subscribe over at doll.com, D-A-H-L.com. All right, so that pretty much does it with all the sponsors and the news coming up. I want to thank everybody who tuned in to my big 50th episode with David Wild. The guy was so nice to take time out of his day, really short notice, but he was there for a fan. And, uh, you know, he's on the Adam Carolla show every week pretty much. And it just seems like Adam Carolla's people, they're all good people, it seems like. And I just want to give a shout-out to Adam Carolla. He is definitely my number one broadcasting idol. He's really super good to his fans. I was saying nobody else would stay outside the Park West signing every single autograph. The line was wrapped around the venue like twice. But he was never, he would never, you know, turn down a fan. He signed autographs. He took pictures for everybody, even when he had two sold out shows to do. And I was in between the two shows. And he still, I was at the end of the line and I was thinking, hey, Adam's going to just, you know, call it quits and get backstage so he could get ready for the next show. Not so much. He would just postpone the next show for a little bit while he made sure every signature was signed. That means a ton to me, the fan. And uh, that's why I want to tell my listeners to go pick up his new book. It's called Not Taco Bell Material. It's uh, available where all finer books are sold. I got mine's at Barnes & Nobles in Oak Brook, Illinois. Um, it's a great book, real funny. His first book was great, too. It's, that was called In 50 Years We'll All Be Chicks. That was more of a biography. This is more of just um, individual stories and short stories. But the guy is insanely funny. So quick-witted, you know, and he's very down-to-earth, and he's great to his fans. So that's why Adam Carolla means a ton to the Andy Dare show and always will be. I've had a ton of people from his show on my show, and I can't thank Adam enough for all the stuff he's put out there for his fans. So on behalf of all my sponsors, my listeners, my guests, I now want to introduce my episode 51 interview with Chris Kirkwood of the Meat Puppets. Hey Chris, how's it going? It's Andy. Hi Andy. Yeah, you're on the Andy Dare Show. Uh, Thanks you so much for taking the time out of your uh, Sunday morning. How you doing, man? I'm fine, man. How you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Just waking up. It's a gorgeous, you know, 85 degree day, sun's shining. So couldn't think of a better way to spend it than interviewing one of my idols. Definitely. Oh, oh yeah. Who are you going to talk to? <laughs> yeah, talking to Chris Kirkwood here uh, from the Meat Puppets. You guys uh, got a brand new book out, uh, Too High to Die, Meet the Meat Puppets uh, by Greg Prado. Um, just started leafing through it a couple days ago. Um, pretty awesome read, though. You got a bunch of cool interviews on there. Pretty cool history. It's all linear, so you know you start from the beginning, work your way through your guys' much storied career. Um, have you been able to t- take a read through that? Um, I I I scanned through it and read little bits here and there. I haven't read the whole thing though. You're probably uh, pretty accustomed to your own story, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
So definitely that, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, but I mean, it's still, it's really, it's pretty fucking interesting to see other people's takes on it from, uh, you know, from that angle. So sure. Yeah. You guys have very cool interviews on there. Um, it's really, it's written really well. And, uh, we're, um, how much how much time did it take for you guys to put that together, or for Greg to put that together? Was this like many years in the making, or was this something that just came together soon, recently? Um, now it it, it it took a while. I know that. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, Greg said he wanted to do it at a point. It's definitely been I don't know, a couple of years, maybe, or something. However long it took him to p- compile all the interviews, you know, and, and then put the whole thing together. I don't know. He did it. You know, I mean, the guy entirely did it himself, so it's just... Hey, was he just a big he fan? A while, or, was he just huh? a big fan or a friend of your guy, of you guys from uh, way back, or is he just a big fan of the Meat Puppets? No, he's a he's a rock writer, is what he is, so... Um, and uh, just decided that this would make, you know, a good... Yes, yeah, it's definitely about. not a subject that's been covered much. I mean, there's not many Meat Puppets books. There's pu- a lot of books about the whole alternative scene, the SST scene and all that stuff, but nothing that just, like, totally delve into your guys' history. And 30 years plus, that's there's a lot to talk about, right? Oh, definitely, you know, and I think that as far as, just as far as, you know, somebody that would be into the arts enough to be a writer about the arts like he is, you know, or for, you know, somebody, even like myself, you know, as a fan of the of, music and, sure. and whatnot the, the you know the uh the band has been around long enough and you know to where it's easily something that can be you know that's an interesting tale it's an interesting story if nothing else you know even it having been my own tale it's still just it's like well it's definitely been colorful and it's in you know a fairly unique way to to uh to get by and and then for it to have gone on as long as it has to encompass you know the, the years and the lives lived through it you know it just sort of has become something that, you know, it seems like would be, uh, you, you know, would make for an interesting story. And Greg obviously thought that and started to put this thing together. Very cool. Is it hard for you to trust a writer? Do you think they're going to come out with some skewed version of the truth? Or was this guy somebody that you guys just clicked with and you thought, oh, this guy's going to, you know, tell the truth, you know? It's, uh, you know, it's it's just down to something like this. I mean, look, at you wanted to talk to me, so, you know, I'm willing to do it. It's just, you know... It's more like that, you know. It's just uh, there's that uh, symbiotic relationship that exists. Uh, <laughs> sure, yeah. it's not yeah. like you know artists. Uh, it, 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 there's another guy that's uh, you know actually working on a book and has done some other writing about the band. This guy Matt Larman, and he's he, he did a, like a symposium on Kurt's lyrics, you know, which I thought was really interesting. At, at like last year at the uh, South by Southwest or something in that. And now he's working on a on a, on a you know a book himself. Cool. So and, he's just he's just tackling the lyrics. He's getting into the poetry well, he, a little. I, I I think I think that you know I, I'm not sure what you know where he's coming from with the book specifically, but he at least has actually had you know like these you know kind of like you know uh, just that symposium kind of a thing where I, you know I don't know how well it did or anything, but uh, you know getting into the you know that side of uh, of the band specifically. But he and I were talking about books and I was shared some of you know a few he, he got back in touch and asked me about this one book that I uh, mentioned it was actually about Michelangelo it's a cool book it's called Sistine Secrets and he had asked me what the name of it was and I was able to find the name of it because I've loaned the book out since cool. but uh and it, it, it's you know it's just once again people you know and you know there's somebody that's had a lot of books written about him and it, this was a really interesting book that that took the slant that Michelangelo's you know uh Neoplatonic upbringing at the end of the Medici's, you know, enabled him to put all this like Kabbalistic hidden imagery, you know, in the uh, in the Sistine Chapel. So I mean, it's just an weird. <laughs> you know, you just realize that's that, awesome. So there's hidden like little symbols, like you know, suggested- at the Sistine, yeah. But then he suggested back to me. Basically, what it is is you know that that Michelangelo knew enough about like you know these different you know religious traditions, specifically like the the old Jewish traditions is where this book is coming from to hide symbolism in this, in the Sistine chapel that ultimately is a fuck you to the popes that made him. <laughs> well, that's punk rock in back in the day, right? That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and then, yeah, and then Matt, uh, told me about a book the other day and I got online and looked at some of the reviews and just, you know, the, the, the description of the book and what it is, is uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's talking about how, 
you know, art isn't made. I mean, art is made by the artist, the art itself, you know, at that particular point, but what it takes to get art out, you know, there's a collective involved, you know, that there's, so, so basically a part of the collective is people, you know, you're part of the collective, you know, Matt is, you know, Greg. Sure. Yeah, it as, takes a village, kind of. As are the guys, as are the guys working at the fucking, you know, CD pressing plant. You know what I mean? And the sure. distributors and the people that have stores in it. You know, so all that. So that's where that book is coming from, essentially. And awesome. And uh, you know, and and as far as the meat puppets, you know, we early on, I guess, you know, we, we uh, just uh, just because of the you know the tact that we took in terms of the band, you know, what our, what, our, what you know what the emphasis was on coming from us, you know engendered amongst the, uh, you know, the rock writing world, you know, uh, interest, right? So part of the relationship, that we, you know, just part of that support that we've always had in a way, it's just been from a critical angle, you know? So it's just as far as like, you know. As yeah, far that's as like, like very cool. Like you're saying you can't do it by yourself. You kind of need the whole village to help well, you, just, help just, you up. Yeah. There's that. I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, I do what I do by myself, and then definitely, you know, the art gets taken out, and I don't fucking walk around hawking the things, you know. So there's <laughs> yeah. that. Like, but also, just just in terms of like, like you said, it was Greg the guy or whatever. I mean, definitely there was some, you know, you know, it was looked into, you know, what he'd done and whatnot, and his other writings and stuff, and it was just, you know, you quickly realize. But I mean, on the other hand, I'll fucking talk to anybody, you know. It's just <laughs> like, yeah, you, know, you know. So there's that side of it too. You know? Sure, that's awesome. And so you had an art show like last spring. I mean, at Carly's Bistro and stuff like that. Um, what's next for your artwork? I heard you got some stuff up on eBay, or is that still up on eBay? Or? It's not right now, but you know, if people want my crap, they can get in touch with the band's website, and I'll I'll sell them my my stuff. I, I like to draw, you know, I like to fucking draw, and I always have. And the band, you know, was a an art collective early on without us even re- realizing it, you know, amongst the three sure. of us. And, and then we all like to draw, you know, and and, uh, and paint even. And and, uh, this, and then my stuff, you know, I do it like therapeutically, therapeutically, and, uh, and uh, you know, wound up with enough stuff, and it's just, you know, just the next kind of a you know serendipitous kind of a move and then a thing and actually you know we'll see what what happens with that. I have some folks I'm working with some people up in San Francisco, Cut Merch, it's the name of the company and they're they're actually you know working with the art as, as a licensable entity. Oh nice. So, you know it's more of the same stuff. You know it, it it all developed from an interest in like myself. You know an interest in the arts and the you know an interest in like what it is to be. You know and and and, and how I want you know I want to go about you know. Just being, yeah. <laughs> Living my life, you know, with those considerations in mind, and, and ultimately it wound up, you know, just you know, heading in the direction of music and, and, and you know, the arts, the arts man. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and uh, and then from there it's just kind of, you know, continue to grow out in a way, in, in, in a really fucking interesting and yeah, I've really enjoyed long, watching long, like your your path, your journey, you know, and like some of those album covers are totally iconic. Um, did you pretty much put together all the album covers yourself, or was there a couple that you didn't do yourself? Or uh, no, we totally did. The one that we, I mean, we still put it together, but the one piece of imagery that wasn't specifically chosen by us, I think, was too high to die. Oh, okay, gotcha. Huh? You know, and but I mean, it was it was okayed by us, but the, you know, we had some, you know maybe that hadn't been put together and the record company put together something we're like, Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Yeah. Why mess with it? But, uh, um, do you sell prints of the album covers at your shows or is it more just like all, all new stuff? Occasionally, occasionally like I, I know a batch of posters got made up for the puppets too. Sure. I mean, two is still like your most known work. I mean, you you've got like a handful of classic albums besides two, obviously, but it seems like you guys have been playing two pretty much in full nowadays. Uh, there's, there's a handful of songs off that that have gotten played a lot in the last few years. Sure. Yeah, but, uh, I got to see you guys at the Double Door in Chicago in November of last year, and let me just tell you, my mind was completely blown. I mean, I just wish I could keep up that excellency when I'm your guys' age. I mean, I'm, I'm about to hit 30, but I can't, I can't imagine, like, you got, you got that new drummer, Shandon, right? How do you pronounce that, Shandon? Yeah. Yeah, he was awesome brought a new energy to you guys, but you guys were just completely like no holds barred, just excellent and uh, completely your own style. I mean, psychedelic with roots and country, but roots and punk too. one foot in each genre. I just loved seeing that, you know, dichotomy and there's nobody else on the scene that's touching you guys right now, as far as, you know, making your own noise like that. Um, how was that tour well, for you guys? 
you know, they all are. I mean, everybody is, you know, I mean, you, I guess, whatever. I, I, you know, I didn't like that to me. I, you know, it's not like it, there's nobody else or whatever. I mean, people are just doing what they fucking do, you know, and this is the particular direction that we headed in. And and, uh, and it's definitely interesting, you know. There's a lot of... It, it's it's interesting to have done this for so long, you know, because I'm 51, and we started the band when I was 19, you know. So to put that kind of, you know, to have that many years uh, go into something, you know, and then to have all the, you know, your life being lived with this, you know, particular thing along with it. Riding it, a shotgun it, with you, yeah. <laughs> and, and to wind up at this age where it's just like, Jesus, I ain't no kid anymore, you know, mm-hmm. and yet the skill be able to find, you know, to have the art still be something that's interesting. And it's definitely, uh, uh, no, it's, 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 it's just that it's interesting. So. It's something cool that we didn't have, they, you know, that people didn't have in the seventies and sixties where you had the aging elderman of the scene still completely, you know, rocking the socks off of the kids. You know, you didn't have that in the sixties. I mean, you had a couple aging rockers, but nothing much. Now you got Neil Young, you know, almost hitting 70. You got a bunch of of guys out there that are still cranking them out and still, you know, going on these long tours and, you know, filling these theaters and stuff like that. How was the tour for you guys? Is it, it's obviously got to be different from, you know, the nineties or the eighties for you. Is it is it different for you, or is it still that same passion with you? Uh, you know that, that that was always it's it's still real similar. I mean, it's it's really really similar in a lot of ways to the you know to the eighties. You know, we still carry our own crap and drive ourselves. You know, <laughs> nice. I didn't know that. You know, you know, it's just it's just what goes into actually being able to you know make art. You know, because it's all dependent upon you know, your ability to continue to do it, you know, and uh, we find that at this age, and that's what the interesting element is, you know, it's just still the desire to do it, you know, the wherewithal to do it to the degree that we can, you know, it's not the same as when we were younger, but, you know. You know. It's kind of like a relationship, like you still love her, but it's slightly different, obviously, because time's gone by, but you still have that same love in your heart, kind of. You know, somewhat, definitely, you know, I mean, definitely, Kurt and I still love to play, you know, it's just, and, and that's a, a wonderful thing. And to, you know, and then it just, the time that has gone into it has allowed for it to take on, you know, different aspects. You know, when you're young, there's the, the joy of discovery or something, but then once you put a lot of time into it, there's the, it, it has on, it takes on, you know, just that much time having been devoted to something, you know, and, and that much practice of doing it and whatnot. So it just has a different element to it, you know, and, 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 and you know, it's so interesting. That's the, the really pleasing part. And, you know, uh, you know, I find it, as as a fan, like I said, of the arts, you know, that the, the band is developing into something that's like, well, look at there, you know, this is just like, you know, reading about other artists that I enjoy, you know, and seeing them go through the different periods that they've gone through in their career, you know, or in their, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, in their, in their career and, and being able to look at it, you know, and, you know, once they're gone or something like that, or, you know, while they're still alive, even in, you know, an overview of their history up to the, up to that point, you know, and the band has definitely gotten to that. You know, it's just like just just through dint of you know through of longevity. Sure. Yeah. Like, do you still stay up on like the whole music scene as far as you know, like what's coming out new? Like, who would you want to support you guys on tour? Is it is it your choice still? And like, do you keep your ear to the streets as far as what's new in underground alternative music now? Or somewhat, somewhat. You know, and it's it's definitely our choice. You know, somewhat. You know, and uh, you know as to who goes out with us. And, and we, we do sort of, I mean, it's not, you know, we're not quite, you know, get to just completely go, okay, it's this, and here's how we're going to do this and all that kind of stuff. A lot of that stuff is dependent upon commercial considerations, you know, and like, sure. you know, the kind of, you know, what, what you can actually, you know, afford and kind of, what'll bring the kids out. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of a thing, you know, it's just, so, uh, and, you know, but I never really did that heavily keep my ear to anything or anything like that. You know, it's just more, it's been a very personal sort of a, a, of a, of a trip for me. And yet, you know, I have things that I love and I'm constantly hear things. It's like, oh, that's neat. You know, definitely all sorts of stuff that goes on. It's, it's interesting. Very cool. Yeah. I'd like to take it like back for the Kirkwoods. Um, What kind of kids were you guys? You guys grew up in Tempe? Or? No, we grew up in uh, Sunny Slope is where we grew up. Oh, okay. We eventually moved down to Tempe. Sunny Slope's in the north part of Phoenix. It was back when we were kids. You now it's the, uh, the central part of Phoenix, but uh, Phoenix has grown a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, we grew up up there in Sunny Slope, and uh, we were, you know, we were kids like anybody else, I would imagine. 
Sure, was it artwork first or music first, or was it just being a, rebe- uh, no, a rebellious that, teenager? No. no, it wasn't any of that, really. It was more like, you know, trying to avoid getting, you know, thrashed by <laughs> whichever, you know, abusive husband mom was married to at that particular point. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, that helps write songs down the line, though, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah not necessarily. No, it uh, that hurts you, it. Yeah. <laughs> love in general. Yeah, love love overpowers all that, you know. Uh, you know <laughs> but we had, we had you know, we had childhoods like anybody does, you know. We had a mommy that loved us and you know, and we didn't grow up with our pops, you know, our dad and mom split up when we were real tiny. And uh then mom got remarried uh, uh part of you know, a few times and, and and uh there was a you know, an element of stability and an element of chaos there, just like there is in so many families and and, uh, and, you know, I think the chaotic side of it probably played a bit of a part in it, you know, had we been raised, you know, had mom and, and dad stayed together, who knows. But uh, So not the white know, picket fence, really, uh, but uh, did that, uh, was, it, was it like a better situation being at away from the house, like going to school? Did you prefer that or was it hard fitting in at school or making the grades? Uh, no, it wasn't hard making the grades, really. You know, neither of us had that big of a struggle, you know, grade wise. And then we both graduated from Brophy College Prep here in Phoenix, which is a, a venerable old Jesuit institution that mom wanted us to go to for the, its higher educational nice. qualities. So uh there was that, you know, and uh uh you know, and it was definitely, you know, at points good to get out of the house there and, and eventually, you know, you know, once once we finally moved out on our own, you know, that's you know the band started before I even moved out of mom's house, though, so. How about early inspirations as far as, like, musically starting the band? Was it mostly punk, or was it all this amalgam of stuff that you guys now kind of reflect in your music? You know, it's definitely that. I mean, I got into music personally. I started actually playing music in, like, 74, 73, 74, after seeing uh, the movie Deliverance. Oh, nice. Awesome. Uh, yeah, you no, know, it's a, it's it's you know this is a well told tale now. You can read about it in the book. Um, <laughs> you know, I would imagine. I, I'm sure I've told Greg this, but uh, I actually saw that you know the banjo sequence in that just I thought was really really intriguing. You know, and as a uh, 13 year old or whatever I was, I went out and got myself a banjo at this cool little music shop up in Sunny Slope that was run by a uh, this guy. Uh, what was his name? Joe McClarty, McClarty Music, and the guy had been like a, a contemporary of like Barney Kessel, and I think Kurt actually took some some lessons from the guy. You know, Kurt Kurt got into the guitar and kind of had it, always kind of had a guitar around at a point. You know, when we were pretty young, and and uh, and I I didn't get into it. You know, Kurt and I shared an interest more. You know, we were into dirt bikes as kids. You know, so Kurt and Kurt got into you know we got into mini bikes, got sure. mini bikes for Christmas one year, and then the desert allowed you know for the desert was a lot closer back then. Phoenix was a much smaller town. And that was more like through our, you know, our adolescence and our, you know, our mid teen years, you know, and uh, that's, that's what was kind of a shared interest there. And then I got into, you know, playing banjo at a point and took some lessons from a guy up there. And uh, a few years into that, you know, and then Kurt, at some point Kurt went away to college, you know, and I never did that. And then, and uh, somewhere around 15 or 16, I decided that, you know, I realized that bassist had even one less string than a bluegrass banjo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that works. Simplify, yeah. right? Were, yeah. The, the strings were thicker. They were farther apart. <laughs> and I just suddenly, I don't know, some bass suddenly caught my fancy in a way, you know, and things were heading in a, in a direction there, and, and I wound up going out and getting myself a, a bass. How about a bassist in the 70s that was influ- influential for you starting out? No, well, it was all those guys. It was all the '70s stuff, and that definitely coming up in the '70s played a part in in the band's development. You know, because if anything, you know, uh, you know, there was some really good players. You know, there was like a playerly side of things. You know, where you actually had a grasp of the, of the instrument in a, in a more like you know in a more typical fashion or something. You know, where you got guys that actually know what the fuck they're doing. You know, definitely, yeah. Like like, like somebody like Zappa. You know, where it's just like, oh my god. You know, where the dude you know, now is, you know, uh, you know, considered one of, you know, a a composer, right? You know, because he wrote actually like, you know, he did rock music, but he also did, you know, other stuff. He's one of the neoclassical composers, you know. Sure, yeah. 
you know, and he taught himself all that stuff, you know, just such a grasp of music. So there's that side of it. There's, there's definitely like a, a playerly side. And I never got, I took some, you know, I had a handful of lessons, you know, and then actually, you know, kind of looked into studying music sort of, but never really followed through with it. But definitely some of my biggest influences are guys that actually knew what they were doing, like Phil Lesh, the bass player from the Grateful Dead. Oh, definitely, right? yeah. You know, where you got, you know, and it's just such an interesting combination for me where, you you know, here's a guy that's actually a schooled musician, you know, studied theory, studied composition, you know, with with notable fucking teachers, you know, at a, at a, at a higher level. And and then, you know, started dropping acid, you know, so it's just a bitching combination of, you know, <laughs> of, of uh, psychedelia and, and, you know, a grasp of the instrument. You and know, classicism so. at the same time. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and, and I never followed through with, you know, uh, with, uh, getting that, getting that, you know, uh, what's studying the theory on, mm-hmm. on, the, yeah. on the, you know, the, the language of music that's been developed over the last few centuries, you know? So, but that, that definitely just at least like moving your fingers that much or having, you know, you having like the, the technical side of things being, you know, uh, being an element in it, that played it, you know, an element in the development of the band. And, uh, and then, you know, meeting Derek and getting turned on to he was more uh, versed and he was into the punk rock thing and was into the 70s thing that came out of, you know, the mid-70s and the and the later 70s, you know, from England, all the seven inches and, and, and New York and the coast and stuff. And, you know, the the spawn of the Ramones, you know, and uh, and then, you know, you combine that with Kurt and I being these fucking, you know, guys with a, just at least an interest somewhat in like a, just this other side of it where it wasn't just strictly about, you know, that punk energy or, you know, the ideal of the concept, but it was, you know, it was that punk energy combined then also with like, you know, moving your fingers a little bit more or something. Sure. You put the Americana vibe in with the punk, you stirred it up a little bit. That's, yeah, I don't know. That was, that was, you know, that was purposeful. That was, you know, the direction of, you know, uh, us, you know, being in charge of what the fuck we did, you know, and having been playing in, in the punk rock scene for a while at that point, you know, and having gone, <clears throat> gotten into it when, you know, we, uh, we started going out to Los Angeles and the people that we met were, were, uh, you know, and who we, you know, got to know and where there was an element out there that was, you know, kind of artier, you know, it hadn't, gotten to the point just you know it wasn't just hardcore you know there was a really arty element to the punk rock scene you can go back and look at the you know the la punk rock scene and these different bands that that were you know uh lumped into the whole punk scene you know but it was the cool element there right it was the cool the cool element of the punk rock scene sure like kind of like x or x is kind of that same way right X was definitely there but then even going even getting you know further out where you got like the you know the screamers you know, and, and specifically the people that we became friends with were a band called Monitor, you know, and they were very arty, you know, and not at all in any way hardcore, and yet it was still all, you know, under the punkish, punkish umbrella. It was just, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, down to it being punk for us. It was just something like this realm where, and, you know, you, you could have these disparate groups coming from these little, you know, towns here and there that had come up with their own thing, you know, and weren't necessarily that reflective of each other, but we're still you know, all about it. It, the, 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 the core connection was just that, that they were doing their own thing, you know? And, uh, it was interesting, you know, to see kind of, you know, bubbling along all of a sudden, you know, you mentioned the sixties and it's kind of like, you know, to realize, you know, this is this cool, this is our little, our, our already little scene here, you know, yeah. the that it, it, it is where, and it was a realm, a realm of, you know, of ideas as much as anything, you know? And, and, uh, that's awesome. So, like in the beginning of like when you guys were dealing with that early punk, it was punk wasn't much of a sound yet. It was more of an attitude and just like a community. It was it hadn't right. turned into the hardcore because then that would also turn into its own like just join the bandwagon of the hardcore sound. What towards the late '80s or mid '80s kind of? Um, yeah, you know that definitely. I mean, it was coming along that that stuff. You know, I mean, it was just punk was you know it was that. It was just it was. It just as rock and roll was, you know, suddenly that that same sort of a thing where it was it wasn't so much specifically about anything other than human expression in the way that you know new art movements come along, you know, or new musical styles or whatever, and suddenly you know that the circumstances and history and all, everything all combines together, to, you know, to create this new, you know, 
its flavor, but it's just, it's the same old thing though. It's the same old thing people have always been getting at. It's, I think it's where religions came from, you know, and you know, and where you know people painting on cave walls came from, you know. Sure. Yeah. I never really thought about it like that. Like the religion, could you can compare religion to the music genres? Like it starts off as just a community experience, uh, you know, express yourself, do your own thing, and then slowly but surely it gets watered down till it turns into its own uh, behemoth, kind of. Yeah, it just becomes you know formulaic or whatever. I mean, once it's actually gotten to the point, you know, you know, where. It suddenly has a name, you know, you can actually go, okay, now it's not just a bunch of dudes doing blow and, you know, buggering in the bathroom, you know, now it's called disco or whatever, you know, and then, you know, and then, then it, you know, you see, at least in rock and roll, suddenly it becomes, you know, like here's, here's Elvis, right? And it's just obviously a national, he's the, you know. And you got your Elvis, Elvis copycats and it's just like grunge, like grunge started off like dangerous and cutting edge and just about a feeling and a vibe. And then it turned into, okay, we got to get everybody dressed in jeans and a flannel shirt or a gas station attendant shirt, you know? <laughs> right. And definitely that, you know, yeah, you know, kind of like that. And then, uh, you know, in punk, you know, in the early days when we were playing, you know, there was that. And then you see it kind of start, you know, we suddenly, you know, we're able to not only do the artier shows, you know, but we, we had a, a loud and fast element that, you know, enabled us to just wind up playing shows with, you know, uh, bands that were definitely starting to, you know, develop, you know, were like the Black Flag, you know, the, the people that were, you know, inventing hardcore in a way, you know. <laughs> Pretty like, much, were, yeah. Were, you know, and I mean, it was it all comes from the Ramones, you know, in terms of that particular approach, you know. And, I mean, it all comes from Elvis, it all comes from fucking Caveman, you know, it's a human <laughs> thing, but, but, you know, uh, uh, once, you know, I mean, Me Puppets 2 was really specifically us just going, you know, you know, know that our corner is actually a round corner, you know, from into which we can't be painted. Nice. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Like, how did SST come into the picture? Uh, we played some shows. We played with Black Flag out here. They came through town. Actually, they came to town, and we didn't play them. We went and saw them, and were aware of them through their, their their really earliest releases. And the first time we saw them, it was still just Chuck, Greg, and and uh, Robo with Dez singing. Nice. And uh, and they were good, man. It was just like yeehaw, you know. And and uh, and, uh, and then they came to town a while later, and I think Hank had started playing with them at that point, singing with them, and Dez was playing guitar. And we played with them, and they and they dug it. I guess they liked us, and they invited us to come out to Los Angeles and play with them, you know. And uh, I feel like Greg would be more was, open to like a different sound than Hank would be. Am I right about that, or is well, is, SSG was you know was already up and running, and Black Flag was already established by the time Henry came into the picture with them, you know. And Henry had been doing stuff in D.C., but you know he joined a, a, you know Black Flag, which was already you know established. And and his Henry's part at SST. You know, it was Greg's and Chuck's label at that point, you know, and sure. it wasn't so much Henry's label. So as far as like when it got to the point where, you know, those guys started asking other bands to do stuff, you know, they started out SSG to get their own stuff out. And the Minuteman came into the picture real quickly. And then and then we came into the picture, you know, and, and uh, I think that was, you know, reflective of, you know, Greg's, uh, you know, Ear and Greg's and Chuck's, you know, ear and you know, and, and their ideas about what the, the direction they wanted to go with the label, and, and you know, amazing, and you know, the uh, the uh, the quality of, of the you know, just the you know, A and R job or whatever, you know. Sure, like I can't I can't think of a label with a larger range at that point or at all in in the entire time I've listened to music. I mean, you had everything from like the replacements. To, you know the Minutemen. That's that's completely a huge range. Uh, so I, I got, got to give that all to Greg, pretty much, to have that. You know, I don't I don't think the Replacements ever did an SST record, though. I thought they did a uh, Stink, or or was it? Uh... Well, I could be wrong. Though. I'm not, I'm not one for facts. So I got you. Know I, I got you. I thought I read that somewhere, have. but. Well, but for sure, Husker, you know, I mean, speaking of Minneapolis fans, at least, you know, I mean, Husker was definitely had, did a bunch of records with them, you know, and and it was just, you know, it was it was a. Uh, it was a uh, you know the the cool side of flag and something that you know I think was maybe I, mean, I don't know where where they were coming from with it specifically but you know they were definitely seen as hardcore and, and you know and their fans were insistent upon them you know doing this one particular thing and maybe they found that constrictive and wanted to you know make sure their label 
it was a little bit more representative of a broader range of things or something. But I think, you know, one of the the cool little, uh, you know, consistencies through there, the one thing that, you know, that tied it all together was that they found, you know, through their travels and whatnot, uh, you know, ran into other bands that were a lot like them in a way, even though they're from Los Angeles, which isn't, you know, in, in any way like a, a rural backwater or whatever, you know, uh, they were still, you know, from like the South Bay or South Beach kind of area or wherever the hell they're from. And, and you know, it just had developed on their own. And, and uh, you know, you just get these bands that are, you know, reflective of their environment to the degree that they are, you know, and, and yet, you know, unique unto themselves and it's just a right, you know, an opportunity to put together a label that had, you know, real, real focused, you know, hardworking sort of people that were working real hard and focused upon their own particular art trip. You know, so that's, that's awesome. And like back then, like he had to just get in the van and just travel America and, you know, find those bands. You could, it wasn't just like put on his desk this is a thing where you actually had to actually go go meet the people, go pound the flesh, go you know p- pass out flyers and whatnot. It it was a much more difficult experience, but probably more rewarding than it is in 2012. I'm guessing, right? Uh, not necessarily more rewarding because the, you know the thing that I was always about the part of it that's rewarding to me is actually winding up with the guitar hanging off my shoulder with my brother on the other <laughs> side of the stage, you know. So ultimately, you know, that part of it is still the most rewarding part of it, you know. I, and it was it was it was something that coincided time-wise well with my being a lot younger, you know? So, yeah. And I mean, you know, it's still, you know, what's still required in terms of that is, you know, safe driving, you know, safe transportation. Sure. Yeah, that hasn't changed. Yeah. You know? And that was always the same thing, you know, but definitely back then it was, it was, it was a, a unique, you know, sort of a thing to be involved with. And, and, but it wasn't that unique. It was unique under its own particular version of this, but I mean, it's what we've been talking about, the development of, you know, artistic styles, you know, or artistic, you know, whole, you know, genres of art or whatever, you know, and how in the beginning, you know, somebody has an idea and they start to do it and then it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's disseminated at, you know, out and, and uh, through their, you know, through their, have, you know, insisting on just doing the work that they want to do. And it's, you know, it, it builds them the momentum that it does, you know, and they get out to the degree that they do. And, and, and you know, it's was, it was definitely uh, uh, like a homemade thing all the way around back then, for sure, you know, where it's just these handful of like-minded folks that it, you know, got caught up at a particular point, you know, and everybody stayed on each other's floors, you know, if they did, you know, that, that the group, awesome. all, you know, all these people stayed, we'd stay at, you know, wherever the hell we could, and people, you know, would become promoters in their own town, or would start their own label like Black Flag did, or, you know, and then would work to find, you know, the, the distribution for the record for the records and whatnot. And there's people out there that have little record stores and it just slowly kind of grew. And then, you know, and then uh, at a point, you know, there was definitely like Nirvana that broke it open into a, a you know, a flat out commercial realm. But, it, but the, you know, it wasn't like the, the record labels and the business guys weren't, you know, around way before that trying to figure out how to, you know, cash in on what had, had taken on a, you know, such a distinct personality at that point. I mean, Husker got signed to Warner's, Warner Brothers and like, 85 or something. You know? Sure, yeah, they were an early one. Um, talking about like finding your own style throughout the 80s, you guys really switched it up a lot. I mean, you had two where you kind of like, you know, exposed yourself as being, you know, having those psychedelic influences and those, you know, cow punk influences. I hate that word, but anyways. Um, but then like Mirage, you guys were playing around with drum machines and synthesizers a little bit. How was it making Mirage? And was that like a... Did you guys go into the studio saying, let's change it up a little bit, or was it just a natural, you know, growth? No, it was never like purposely, let's change it up, you know, for the sake of changing it up. You know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't that. It was, it was changing it up because that was the next area of interest that we wanted to, you know, look into. You know, and it was, an, and, and there's, you know, the natural development of the band in, in, in the particular direction, and the, the growth of Kurt as a songwriter, you know, the development of Kurt as a songwriter, and, uh, you know, where the band was at and the, and the, the, you know, what we felt like, you know, where we were at and what we were given, you know, it's just what we came up with. That's what we made. You know, those are the things that we made, but that, it wasn't purposely just for the sake of, you know, being, you know, let's do this different, you know, it was just where we were at at that particular point, but, you know, you know, not for its own sake, but we certainly weren't constrained by, you know, uh, the 
dictates of you know people's tastes you know and their demands of that you know something that they like continues to put out some you know a similarly flavored sort of a thing as far as we were concerned it was similarly flavored because we were the ones that were making the music you know and it's, it's other people who have you know a need or an issue or, or their desire or the inability to not you know peg things sure. and then you know, and then, then that's it. You know, and it's just like, well, no, that's not why I got into music. You know, I got into music because it's, you know, uh, well, one of the reasons definitely is just, you know, it's the, it's the realm of the imagine, you know, your, your imagination. You know, it's, it's just. It. Sure. And it's not like you had a record exec telling you how to sound or do, you know, change your image or try to get on MTV at the time. And then you no, would move. Yeah. It was not no, a important. Uh huh. That was it was that was not of any importance to you guys, pretty much, right? Uh, getting a major label, you mean? Well, just uh, well, just well, you guys would go to London uh, afterwards, MTV right? Yeah, get on MTV, have a video that would be played, you know, a hundred times a day. That's not that wasn't your style. Uh, no, you know, if it had happened, it w- we certainly wouldn't have, you know, asked them not to do it if they <laughs> wanted to play something that we've done, you know. And we made videos, you know, we made videos even back in, you know, the. The earliest of days. I mean, there's that there's that video that we did for Bid on Down off of Mirage. Sure. That uh, you know, and we shot that. You know, Daryl, our sound guy, shot that with his, you know, the, the video camera that he borrowed from his parents. You know, yeah. and we, you know, and did it ourselves. And you know, and if it, if it had been played, you know, a ton of times, that it was fine. But it wasn't the, you know, our specific intent to, you know, figure out what those people wanted. And you know, and and. Uh, you know, what the business, you know, what the guys running MTV or the major label guys wanted, or even the listening audience, you know, we were definitely, you know, interested in doing what we wanted to do, but, you know, there's... It's not a goal. We, no. we, we yeah. weren't, you know, we weren't anti that happening. I mean, the business side of things has, has way more been like, a, you know, what's presented itself. You know, we haven't specifically targeted, you know, sure. the, the commercial aspect of the arts, you know, and and, and yet we've been involved in it because, you know, We've been fortunate enough to have people, you know, want to, uh, you know, do business with us, uh, you know, while we're only doing what we want to do, you know. That works. That seems like the best way, the best path to take for me, at least. Um, so well, it's, 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 yeah. it's, one, it's, it's, it's a path to take. I mean, yeah. definitely other people have made a fucking lot more money than <laughs> I have. <laughs> yeah, um, like, so the late 80s, you had Huevos and you had Monsters, you guys are getting back into the heavy sound, and at the same time, that whole Seattle scene is kind of growing some feet. Um, how come you guys left SST? What was that, like, 1990-ish, or... Yeah, just another, for the same, you know, same reason, another business opportunity presented itself, you know, and, uh, you know, we just, you know, a major label asked us if we want to make records with them, and, you know, and like I said, you know, it wasn't like we were purposely not working with those people. It's just a question of what presented itself. And suddenly, you know, there was an interest there. And, and that was before Nirvana had happened, actually, you know, but, but definitely when things were starting to kind of congeal and, you know, and, and it's how, you know, it's how the people that sell art, you know, were doing it at that particular point. You know, I think a, a big part of the entertainment industry is just, you know, the back then they would, you know, try bands out. If a, if a scene started to, present itself or if somebody had a vision that this scene could be something that was commercially potential you know, or had commercial potential or whatever, you know, be, you know, it could make things, uh, you know, would make things happen by signing those things and seeing, you know, if people liked it, you know, you know, the band that people liked would suddenly be the spearhead of a new movement or something like that. But, you know, and then, yeah, it's just, a, that's a, that's a, you know, an element of the, of the business, you know, and I mean, now they have like, you know, American Idol. Now they just put people on TV and go, who do you like? You know, <laughs> pretty and much. Yeah. It's like, so they save a lot of money. They, you know, it's got to be expensive to show on, but that's, you know, whatever that's, you know, the and how many, how many Facebook that. fans you have? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's not like a question of signing, you know, every band that's similar to this band that's suddenly popular and seeing if you can't get a little more action out of that, you know, and, and 90% of it not doing anything, you know, but, Cost there being offset by you know tax write offs or whatever. It's just a, it was a different you know. And London now, didn't put much pressure on you guys, or was was there pressure at that point? Did you feel like oh we gotta we gotta keep pushing, or was it just a was it just another happy circumstance that just came along? It was definitely just that you know I mean because the business side of it has always been like you know you, you know you, you you sell this you know you sell the the sell the art after you make it you know the the. the really interesting part for me has been the, you know, making of the art, but one of the 
elements there that always was apparent was that if you, you know, you fucking, it's a lot easier to make art with a roof over your head. (laughs) True. Yeah. So, uh, for me, you know, or for us and, uh, and electricity, you know, the power, the the fancy little, you know, noise making devices that we had and whatnot. Sure. Food in your belly. uh, Yeah. You know, and, uh, uh, so, so, you know, so, you know, SSG had been, you know, came along and that was a fun relationship and made a bunch of cool records with those guys. And then these other guys came along and it's just like, you know, you know, try this out, you know, and they definitely, you know, people with more money, you know, was presenting us the opportunity to spend a little more time making a record. And it's always, you know, a side of the, of it all that we really enjoyed. And, and uh, you know, it's just like a, a chance to, you know, to let the business take its own, you know, not take its own head or whatever, but to continue to develop in the same way that the music would, you know, just kind of sweet. As, as things came up and you know and suddenly it's like well here's a new song you know here's a new you know here's some folks that want to do you know some business with us and and uh and you know there wasn't necessarily pressure but definitely those people are looking to, to get sales you know and, and with the major label it's like the question of you know you get signed and then you know and then you know either your record does well or it doesn't and then they or, or they drop you you know whereas ssg wasn't so much about like dropping things you know <laughs> dropping bands that didn't do well it was a question of just being able to keep something that was so out of the typical way of, you know, doing, you know, the business, even by that point, you know, that, uh, just keeping it afloat, you know, and it, and it wasn't a, the same business model, but definitely the major labels, you know, it's like, okay, now you're signed, but you know, that's the first step, you know, and then if you want to go on to be, you know, whoever the fuck, you know, that's huge and has had a long career with, you know, a, a successful, you know, uh, who's been able to continue to make the art that they want to make, you know, while doing business with these guys whose bottom line is about the bottom line. You know? Sure. Yeah. Just, then, 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 you know, there's the pressure there. If you can pull that off, you know, and, and, uh, but it, you know, for us, it was just like an opportunity to make a much more expensive record, you know, you know, and, and, uh, and have another record come out. That's what's always our bottom line. You know? Yeah. I love that forbidden places. It, it definitely sounds expensive and expansive too. Um, were they, were the, like, like, like the major label, was that the one who got you on like the opening slot with Nirvana or was that kind no, of Kurt's no. thing? Or? No, that was, uh, no, that was, that came from Cobain. You know? Nice. Long time yeah. fan, obviously. And, yeah, yeah, no, it turns out uh, that, you know, suddenly this band breaks out in such a huge fucking way, you know, it's like, well, look at there, you know, to the degree that suddenly, you know, people that dress at least closer to me than, like, you know, the heavy metal guys. Sure, sure, white snake, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like, well, good, you know, because I, you know, I just never did get a pair of leather pants, you know, it's like, you know, it never happened, you know, but, uh, you know, so uh, suddenly this band is, you know, just huge, and I'm, I'm aware of this band called Nirvana, you know, and their lead singers, you know, Cobain, right? And then then we start hearing him talking about us and, uh, you know, our, our contemporaries, because they, they were a little younger than us. And, uh, and having had been a big fan of, you know, us, you know, us and all, all of our, you know, like... It's flattering, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just key bands, the twin tone bands, just, so, you know, the, the, the and, uh, and then uh, from that, he, he, they asked us to come out with him. That's really cool. Yeah, you know he's not a dumbass if he's got you know really distinct taste in music. He he respects you know the history of the you know the whole do-it-yourself movement. He you know he's not some corporate goomba. But uh, so then you guys you guys went on tour, played a lot of dates with him, and then obviously he asked you onto the MTV Unplugged performance, and history was made pretty much. How was how was that night? Did you feel like you were doing something that was gonna be re- remembered forever, or was it just another gig? Was it did you feel like were all the flowers there did you have a feeling like you might be on the precipice of something big or was it just another another tv show taping kind of thing well you know it was a little both i mean it wasn't definitely wasn't like you know this is this you know we're making history here or anything you know you couldn't know that the guy was gonna you know kill himself so shortly after that you know so i mean that wasn't obvious i mean it was apparent that he was you know dealing with his own issues but uh, you know Everybody had been for years at that point, you know. And, uh, sure. But uh, you know, it was it was a little. It was definitely neat in that you know suddenly we're, you know, you know we're now on a major label. Just certain elements of the of the of the whole experience had shifted slightly, right? Where we're now not just you know carving this thing out of you know whole cloth, you know, and are now being 
they are getting into bed with, you know, people that have, are established in a particular, you know, on the business side of things, you know, and established to the degree that they're, you know, you know, they're these corporate entities, you know, and uh, so there was that side of it where, like, you know, just like I said, making a more expensive record to certain things where you're, like, you know, afforded certain things, but it all happened fairly naturally, and then as far as, like, you know, those guys asking us to do that, it was... uh it was something that appealed on a, on, a, on, a, on a musical level, you know, it was appealing on a musical level. It's just like, well, you know, it, it started off with like uh, talking with Cobain about like cover songs and this and that, and just one evening on, on one of those tours. And then him saying that he wanted to do some of our stuff, they were getting ready to do Unplugged and they wanted, he wanted to play some of the stuff off, you know, some of old, our old songs and it's just like, well, go ahead. And, whatever, you know, and, uh, and, then, sure. and then he just, you know, it was his, he just decided that he would take Kurt and I on TV with him and have us do the, you know, have Kurt do the little noodly guitar parts and me play half-assed bass. <laughs> thing one and thing two, right? And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, for us, it was, you know, it was like, well, that's cool. You know, that's, that's a neat thing. That sounds like fun. You know, musically, it would sound like a fun thing to do. And then, you know, from a, you know, from the the business side of things, I mean, those guys are like the biggest band in the world at this point, you know, and, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, neat, you know, and to see, to see, you know, I, it was interesting just from a, you know, from a, a, you know, an art historian standpoint or whatever, just an art fan standpoint, music fan standpoint to see, you know, to be, to have played a part in being like a, you know, you know, at that point, you start to be able to get some perspective because the years have passed enough and you start to see how like, you know, how history develops into this thing that everybody kind of agrees upon once it's gotten behind it, everybody's able to look at it a little bit and you see, okay, so I mean, we're being seen as like the second wave or the third wave of this <laughs> underground art movement, you know, and, uh-huh. and then a fourth or fifth wave down suddenly it grows into a, uh, a you know, a, a, a much bigger, a uh, visible thing on, on like a, on just, a, you know, not in the underground, it grows out of the underground, you know, so sort of, you know, to kind of, you know. It, you, had, you had history enough where you could see the lineage of what was going on a little bit. Yeah, yeah, you know, and to still be around and, you know, and to be, you know, scooped up in it. It's just more of the fortunate shit, you know, considering what fucking horrible person I am, at least, you know, uh, let alone Kurt and Derek. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to still, be, you know, to be involved in any reality at all, you know, and, uh, and you know, so that was interesting. But as far as it like being, you know, oh, this is historic or anything like that, you know, it's it's, it's more like, you know, here's a band that just had all the elements of timing worked out and suddenly here's this kid from some small town in fucking Washington that goes on, you know, this now one of the biggest stars in the world. And, you know, it's just like and what what does that matter? You know, does it does that matter? And, you know, it obviously did to him, you know, enough, you know, mm-hmm. and uh you know, because it because it is just that side of it all. It's that's the business side of things in a way. You know, but it's also the the cultural relevance of it all, and you know the you know there's a lot of things that go into in, in, into the in the, the makeup of it. But but one of the things that I, I I kind of thought was like, well, okay, this is this is definitely neat. This is I thought it was his decision to take something like this on MTV, and they weren't into it. MTV didn't want want them, want them to do it. You know, really? Okay. It. Huh. You know, because it's the fucking ratty old me puppets that you know aren't here to make everybody money, but are actually here to shit all over everybody's good time. <laughs> you know, and uh, and they're like, oh, and he, he 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 told them, oh no, I am bringing the me puppets on. It was actually, you know, he did that, and I was bitching. That's a bitch in you, so you're fucking, you know, you new, you know, wielding your newfound. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and then uh, you know, and I also thought it was cool and just like. In, in the same way that it's just the, and it's not like you know, uh, you know, communism or anything, but just in terms of like what, what you know, one of the things that that I got out of, of the punk rock thing, where you where you are able to like, uh, you know, use your art as something you know, you know that, that it's yours, you can do with it as you want. And he decided to take this, you know, his old you know a band that he really dug and was still around, and you know, and, and use his his platform is his exceedingly visible platform to, you know, shove us down all these, all these fucking people's fans, you know, throats. And, uh, and I thought that was, you know, reflective of like, you know, the punk ethos to the degree that it was, you know, and I'm not like, like even a champion of the punk ethos or anything. And, but just that, that kind of a thing where, you know, you know, you actually bring out, you know, this whole, 
you know, it is, it is a perfect example of, you know, sticking your neck out for the little guys. Not that you're the little guys, but, you know, punk ethos are you going to, you know, if you get big, you're going to bring, bring along your friends with you, no matter what it's the boss putting, does. Anna. Totally. It's putting the, you know, your artistic considerations in front of everything else, ultimately. You know, there was, there was that side of it. You know, I saw, I thought that that, you know, played a, a part in it. Very awesome. Yeah, I got last year. I got to go underneath his bridge that I uh, uh, in Aberdeen and uh, couldn't ask for a better like memorial. I didn't want to go to some stuffy, you know, museum where I see pictures behind glass. You know, I just it was really cool seeing all the fan art. And I even found like a uh, Smith and Wesson hunting blade. I put that in my pocket. I was like, that's my little souvenir here. And I really felt his aura under there. So like a couple months later, he'd be gone and. Uh, you got the No Joke album. The Dark Ages would kind of begin for the Meat Puppets a little bit, correct? Or... Well, after that, I mean, we put out that, you know, Two Had to Die. Oh, yeah, you got that. And that was actually a big hit with Backwater. I mean, it, it was on the back of the MTV Unplugged performance. But then, like, what, the drugs and the it, people not getting along so much in Meat Puppets kind of? Or... Um, no, no, it was me. No, we were getting along fine. It was just me, being, like I said, the fucking, you know, the reality of me being a, a horrible, awful person, just like em- everybody is ultimately. You know, I mean, sure. what what does it take to turn a whole nation into people that will actually hunt down their neighbors in an attempt to gas their children? You know? Sure. Yeah. What does it take? And, what, and what does it take to take a fucking, you know, a Nimrod like me and turn him into a fucking, you know? <laughs> fucking absolute complete wreck you know it's just it's just the the, the shimmering waves of energy that flow through everything was like the substances you know, something that you had to deal with like who was everything happening too fast or was it more of a relationship no problem, drugs, no, no no drugs are fun and feel good to do yeah <laughs> you know and but if you do too much of them they'll hurt you and i did too many too many yeah was that was like the music suffering at the same time? I like No Joke yeah. a lot, but I mean they, it got bad reviews. Uh, but I I like it a lot. But I you can hear that there's turmoil underneath the surface, kind of. It wasn't turmoil so much. It was pain. Our mother was dying. Oh geez, yeah. You know, so uh, I mean, it was just you know reflective again of who we are as people and where we were. You know, in terms of you know guys who've been making music together and their music, you know, just not being able, but to you know uh to reflect who we are and where we're at at that particular point you know so and like was, like you said your mom was oh, there way mom. or way back when your mom was there when she like you know she had the different husbands your dad wasn't there but she was always there for you guys so it really hit you hard when she was her health was failing her no she was our mom i mean she wasn't there for us she didn't like the band and wish that we'd become you know a doctor and a lawyer <laughs> but uh that's why she sent us to the jesuit high school gotcha <laughs> but uh you know, so she was, you know, she wasn't there like that, but she was our mom, you know. And then, you know, later on after, we, you know, we just went, well, we're going to do what we want to do, thank you, know, and, and, you know, as kids and didn't become, you know, you know, didn't follow her dreams and just went ahead and, you know, did what we wanted to do. And, you know, eventually she, you know, grew to, you know, get the band enough. And then, you know, it was, you know, she's just always pragmatic on on that level, you know, coming to her, her parents, her were children of the Depression, you know, and instilled in her that you know side of things you know pragmatism and uh but uh you know i mean it was our mother and she was you know had become horribly sick and and was was uh not going to make it out of that illness so but you know i called it their album you know in a particular way and you know and then on top of it you know i was you know taking care of her and just decided that i would do a little you know, medical work on myself. Gotcha. And, and yeah. with, with, with it all and, and you know, so it, it, it all started to just, you know, come apart. And then what, what really played a part in it as well, because you, you know, you see bands who are not only, you know, tolerated for being fucked up, but um, almost flat out lionized, like, you know, Keith Richards, you know, magical years. But it's also Keith Richards, you know, I'm not Keith, you know. Yeah. In, in our band, I'm not the Keith Richards. I am the fucking chart, you know, the Bill Wyman. I am, you know, the bass player. You know, Kurt's the guy that fucking, you know, comes up with the material, you know, 98% of the time. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, so suddenly you have one of the side guys. But, you know, what also played a big part in, you know, in, in that, in just in terms of, you know, the direction that things took was that, you know, Cobain killed himself and was, was a fucking junkie, you know. And, sure. uh, and, and we, at that time, were working with, you know, uh, you know, the same management company that those guys had. 
who are still around. Those guys are still around and still, you know. Is that Gold do. Gold Mountain? Or, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. You know, and uh, and you know they still do Dave. They still do uh, what's this name? This um, Grohl's band, you know, and, oh, sure. and and a lot and other stuff, you know. And and, and then at the time they were all just so hurt and you know burned on fucking dope abuse that they, they didn't, you know, that it suddenly I was threatening, you know, uh, you know, you know the. Uh, the business side of things and the relationship that we developed there to be able to get the art done and out and continue to move on. I was threatening our ability to continue to continue and, uh, and, and wasn't just threatening, but actually did, you know, make it you know, unable for us to continue. In the throes of addiction, were you ever turning to artwork to help you? Or was that like, Oh, I can't really think about artwork right now. I got to think yeah, about my well, next. Yeah. And... The art was still there. The art, you know, I mean, you know, you, it would, you know, the the level of fucking, you know, mutation that I achieved was truly heroic. Um, and yet, through it all, there were, you know, I managed to hang on to a guitar or two. And there was always string thing around. Mm-hmm. Nice. And then I did some, I did some actually some really fucking neat art through that at points, you know, at points and whatnot. But mostly my job was fucking self destruction, and and I, you know, I. I did it to, to the extreme, and you know, and the only, the only, the only special joy that you get to experience through hardcore fucking drug addiction that I didn't personally experience was dying. So. And we're glad for that, Chris. Definitely. Yeah, um, my, you know, yeah, and yet my wife Michelle, you know, wasn't yeah. as lucky, right? Yeah. Well, so that's kind of like the dark ages of the band. Um, so, so uh, Kurt, dark ages of me. I mean, it was yeah. the fucking end of it was the end of the band at that particular point, you know. And it was, it was, so you know, Kurt would reconvene with uh, with new guys, but still under the Meat Puppets banner for a while while you uh, figured your shit out, correct? Yeah. Uh, you know, while I, you know, I wasn't figuring my shit out. You know, I finally had my shit figured out for me by the pigs. Oh, yeah. Heard about that. Gotcha. Huh. So... Then what 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 was the light at the end of the tunnel here? Was it uh, like these last three records that you guys did in the late two thousands? Was that it's got to be finding you guys at a much healthier position, much uh, things things seem like they're going better, right? You know, it just it just you know, Kurt continued to do his work. You know, I mean he's the he's the fucking you know the the engine of the band. Awesome. And and you know and. Uh, you know, continue to fucking do the artwork that he, he, he just he just does. You know, it's like I, I play music, but Kurt actually you know makes up music that you know that then I <laughs> I then play. Gotcha. Devoutly and and with you know boundless enthusiasm. You know, but uh, he continued to do the work that he was doing, and you know, and, and I'd taken away his fucking you know his you know our sure band you know the, our band you know that had been together a long time and had a you know and uh, had. You know, a lot of, you know, there's no reason for it, that to have happened. You know, it's all only a fucking, you know, my fault and a, a, a fucking how to not behave if you want to, you know, <laughs> if your first love really is the music, you know, be care the way the pitfalls. And then, you know, it's just all uh, extra retarded because I was in my mid thirties when I really, you know, when things, and I, you know, it's not like you necessarily get wiser as you get older, but you know, there's the possibility that you can. And, you know, we've been through, you know, the, the dangers of, you know, uh, of, you know, just, of, living as younger men, you know, even drug use, you know, dangerous drug use and, you know, it's still a slip in. So, you know, uh, but, uh, anyways, I, you know, I'd fucking fuck shit up to that degree. And then Kurt went ahead and, you know, just continued to do what he does, you know, you know, in spite of having, you know, in spite of me, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, I continued to only unravel till I finally, you know, the whole thing with getting shot and having it, you know, go to, prison yet again you know and and then just the the light at the end of the tunnel is just i I don't know i can't put my finger on it specifically you know other than just the the you know the 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 just the strength of the human spirit and the human body you know like didn't fucking die and uh you know managed to my last spate of incarceration 
uh, and you know, and the healing qualities of time as well. I think you know, just just whatever the fuck to be able to. I finally got to the point in that last time in prison to where I realized that I wasn't going to get out and and immediately run back to dope and attempt to cover up the horror that I'd made of my life in any way and attempt to ameliorate the, the fucking nightmare that my reality had become with you know using more dope you know uh, to you know which is what I'd allowed into my life and had you know turned everything into such shit you know sure. Yeah. And so I just knew at least when I got out that, you know, I got out in 2005 um, that I wasn't going to use anymore. And then there was this, just a series of, you know, just really beautiful fucking, you know, uh, just, you know, uh, very human, uh, you know, set of circumstances that fell into place. I don't know, it's just, you know, uh, my girlfriend's folks took us in. They were wonderful people, really, you know, very supportive and, 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 and you know, very, very giving. They didn't, and they had never even met me before. I, you know, <laughs> That's so awesome. Me. And then uh, I didn't start using again, you know. And then uh, that kept it, you know, kept me above board with the pigs finally. And, uh, you know, and just at a point after I'd been out about a year and a half or something, you, you know, uh, or a year or something, I saw my nephew, Elmo Kurt's kid. And he told Kurt, God, you know, it's, it's uncle who he, you know, who he hadn't seen since he was a child, you know, and, mm-hmm. uh, and Kurt, you know, had never abandoned, you know, he'd, the band never broke up or anything. I just was unavailable. And he was, Kurt was working on some new stuff and had done snow, his solo record and w- w- was looking to make another, you know, me puppets record and asked me if I wanted to do it. So that's awesome. That's so cool. That's such a, you know, set of circumstances that like, you know, that is truly the light at the end of the tunnel. It sounds cliched and, you know, it's cliche to say a second chance, but you mean we're so lucky to still have you around. And you guys, I don't, I mean, I, I didn't hear you back in the day, but I think you guys sound stronger than ever. I mean, this last tour was amazing. Are you guys uh, planning on getting hitting the studio again soon? Yeah, no, we are. This 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 summer here is definitely this, awesome. It's new record time, and uh, no, you know, it's 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 that that part of the story that makes it such a, a, a tolerable and it, I mean, tolerable for me story, you know, but also it really adds another element to it. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the tale of, you know, the, the rock band that, you know, struggles and then suddenly gets a little bit of success, you know, commercial success suddenly has more money than they've ever had, you know, or, or you know, and somebody in the band fucks it all up and, you know, surprise, surprise, you know, but the part that makes it, like I said, tolerable for me because it's my fucking reality, you know, my life. Uh, but also sure. makes it makes an intriguing story, I think, you know, artistically and, you know, uh, you know, uh, why I think, you know, at this point suddenly there's, you know, now there's a book, you know, and I don't think the book necessarily would have been written or necessarily even needed to be written in some ways had it not gone the way that it did. And, you know, by, by grace and, and, and other people's kindness, I was able to, you know, fucking, you know, get my shit back together and, 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 you know, get back together with Kurt and and put in, you know, uh, some more, you know, uh, put another chapter, you know, such a, such a, uh, you know, unique chapter to the, to the story, you know, (laughs) most people don't. And, and I'm, and I mean, I seriously (laughs) plumbed the depths. (laughs) You know, so to be able to come back from that, you know, I mean, that that in itself, you know, I'm, 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 you know, statistically defying the odds, you know, and just in having survived and then to, you know, to, you know, to not, you know, I mean, you know, not go back to jail again, not get back on dope again, you know, those are, that statistically is, you know, I, I'm in the minority there. And then, and then, you know, to actually get back together with Kurt and then to have, you know, the wherewithal and the desire and it's just, this, you know, that, that, that that, you know, what the meat puppets are always all about, that, that, you know, just the mystery of it all to still be there and to, to give us the, the chance to play a little bit more music. You know, that's the part that makes it, that, you know, that's what the light at the end of the tunnel is and what's really added such, uh, you know, heft to the, you know, just to the, our, our own personal tale, the tale of the, the meat puppets. It truly is a tale of survival and like redemption. And are you a religious guy or no? No, no. It's just more like you got you got through it, and now you get to write, keep writing the book of the Meat Puppets. Not that obviously there's a book already, but you get to keep telling your story, keep living it, and that's pretty much the end of the hour, Chris. 
I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. This was very deep for me. I mean, I learned a lot of stuff. There's Go get the book if you want to read more about it. It's Too High to Die, Meet the Meat Puppets by Greg Prado. And uh, that's in most bookstores. Or get it at the at vmeatpuppets.com, correct? Uh, you can get it there. Yeah, yeah, you can get it through our thing, I think. And, uh, yeah, wherever the hell they still sell books, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah, but, but, yeah, ask him. But, yeah, you know, that the book is out. And, uh and uh, and I appreciate that you know, you know you're taking the time because you know really it, it's uh, you know because I'm you you know what I mean and it's just like that's where I came from I dug music as a kid and realized that I enjoyed playing it and that you know it, it was a connection to you know to my you know to my uh, your heroes and yeah my, no to my humanity ultimately you know sure. to you know and to humankind I just was so intrigued you know by people's desires beyond just the, you know, the survival aspects of reality, uh, of, of existence, you know, but actually the realm of, of the mind, you know, and I'm just not bright enough to be, a, you know. <laughs> it's true. So it, whatever, it, you know, so it's, it's like, oh, good, music, you know, well, no, you know, nobody's ass is on the line, and I can suck, and it can still call it art. So. <laughs> That's very true. It's a powerful story. I'm just so glad that you're still around to, you know, keep telling it, and, uh, yeah, the Meat Puppets. Two Eye to Die, Meet the Meat Puppets. Greg Prado, new album coming maybe next year, early next year or something. Check them out on tour. And, uh, yeah, without further ado, I want to thank you for tuning into the Andy Dare Show. And on behalf of Chris Kirkwood, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to follow Andy on Twitter. That's at Andy Dare, A-N-D-Y-D-E-R-E-R. And like the show on Facebook. That's Facebook.com slash The Andy Dare Show videos at youtube.com slash andrew martin dare and it all leads back to the andy dare show.com support our show by supporting our sponsors the mandrake uncle bub's award-winning barbecue and secondhand mall thank you so much for listening